Okay, good morning. Um, so I will discuss today uh, how we map a quantum problem in D dimensions to a classical problem in one higher dimension. It is not always one higher dimension. It is D plus Z, where Z is the dynamical exponent. But first, let me just discuss the case where Z is one. So the mapping is from d-dimensional quantum to d plus one-dimensional classical. And the best way, as I have always emphasized, is to look at the simplest manifestation of that problem, understand that really well, and then move on to more complicated situations. Okay, so let's look at the Hamiltonian for a single spin. And here's the, I'm going to look at a spin half. So these are the Pauli matrices. So sigma Z is um, then coupled with a, in, with a magnetic field H. And this favors the spins to align along the Z direction, favors the single spin to align in the Z direction. In addition, there is the non-commuting term sigma X, which wants the spin to point in the x direction, and that has a strength delta. Um, now, if we view everything in the z basis, then essentially sigma x will take an upspin and flip it down, or a downspin and flip it up. Okay, so written in explicitly in this two by two matrix has uh, the magnetic field h on the z on the diagonals and delta on the off diagonals. And this two by two matrix can be written as sigma dot B. Sigma is once again the Pauli matrix and B is the magnetic field, which has components along the Z direction as well as the X direction. So it's essentially the problem of a single spin in a magnetic field. And I'm sure you have seen that before in a quantum mechanics class here, we will um, use it in an interesting way, which is different from what you have seen before. Now, this two by two Hamiltonian can be easily diagonalized. We have the two eigenvalues denoted by plus minus B, given by the square root of eight square plus delta square. And corresponding with these eigenvalues are the two eigenvectors, chi plus and chi minus. And these are, um, can be described in terms of the polar angle theta and the azimuthal angle phi, which are also given in terms of the, um, these parameters in the Hamiltonian, delta and h. Okay, so once we have this, we have a complete solution of the problem and we can now take any initial state, psi zero, um, write it as components uh, in terms of the eigenstates chi plus and chi minus, and we can evolve it in time based on the Hamiltonian and get the nature of that state or the behavior of that state at any time t. And essentially that they will involve oscillatory uh, functions controlled by the eigenvalue b. So you can see here b, I've set h bar to one, so B essentially has units of inverse time. And these oscillatory functions then tell you how your initial state psi zero will evolve to a state psi t. So this is all well known. Let me now come to um, Okay, let us now look at Look, view this problem in another way, where we can use the behavior, the evolution in time and compare it to what we have studied in this course um, related to the partition function. So the partition function is trace e to the minus beta h. And if we compare these two expressions, we see that if we were to view i t as an imaginary time, then the partition function can essentially be viewed as evolution in imaginary time. So the trace tells us that we start with an initial state 
uh, of the spin at time zero, imaginary time zero, and then evolve it uh, with uh, e to the minus beta h for a time of, uh, of the uh, order of beta, and then return to the same state of the spin. And if we take a uh, sum over all of these initial states, we would get the partition function. So uh, this got cut off, but essentially what I'm showing here is the interval from zero to beta broken up into small time steps delta tau. There are m of them. So m delta tau is essentially equal to beta. Um, now, why are we doing this? The reason is that let's say we start with spin up and after a long time, which is let's say low temperatures, so beta is inverse temperature. So if the temperature is low, beta is a long uh, time interval. So after a long time, we want to return to the same spin configuration. In between, the spin would have remained uh, unchanged for some intervals and would have flipped on other intervals and it would have had some journey as it evolved from time step zero to beta. And that is a very difficult calculation to uh, perform, especially in strongly interacting systems. But what we can gain is by breaking up these time steps into little time steps. We, it's essentially like doing a high temperature expansion because small delta tau is like large temperature. And that we have many ways of doing a high temperature expansion, or in other words here, a small time approximation can be made. So in that way, even if we don't know how a system would evolve over, over a long time scale, we can make judicious approximations for its evolution on a small time step. And that's the main idea of doing this path integral. So essentially what we have done is we have taken the partition function, uh, which was a trace over this initial state, um, and break, broken up into these small time steps. And between each time step, we insert a complete set of states shown here. So our evolution now becomes from the initial time tau equal to zero to tau equal to delta tau with an evolution e to the minus delta tau h. And then from delta tau to two delta tau, again with an evolution e to the minus delta tau h, so on, all the way till we reach beta. Uh, and because it's a trace, the configuration at tau equal to beta is the same as the initial configuration. So that's what we want to do. And essentially what we have done is taken a quantum problem in D dimension and by taking the time evolution and converting it into uh, another di dimension, literally, we have written it as a path integral in D plus one dimension. So in this zero dimensional problem, we essentially have to perform this one dimensional statistical mechanics of uh, essentially spin configurations and we have two to the M of them. And each configuration of these spins on the M sites can, is, as it can be viewed as a path. And we have to sum over all of these paths with a weight factor given by, uh, denoted here by this S, um, the action. Uh, and we have to calculate this weight factor for each path, add it all up, and then get the partition function. Okay, so the problem then reduces to evaluating the partition function over a time step delta tau. So say from L to L plus one, we want to see how does a configuration sigma L Z evolve to sigma L plus one Z under the action of this unitary operator in imaginary time, e to the minus delta tau H. So far, everything has been exact. We have, uh, except that we have made a discretization in imaginary time, but that too, if we were to take delta tau very small in the limit of delta tau going to zero, we would get a continuous path. Now we are going to have to make some approximations which will help us um, solve this problem. And that is the following. If you look at two non-commuting operators, A and B, 
e to the a plus b is given by e to the a times e to the b times this commutator between a and b. Now, since this is where our choice of delta tau being small becomes important. So since uh, we have now uh, this evolution only on the time step delta tau, we get e to the minus delta tau hz plus hx, and they come in here separately, multiplying now the commutator. We can expand this commutator and you can see right away that there is a correction which goes like delta tau square. So if we neglect that, then essentially this uh, commutator uh, is eliminated and we get e to the minus delta tau hz plus hx as just the product of these two terms. And that helps a lot because you, right away you can see hz acting on sigma z um, gives us the energy uh, of, that, um, of that Hamiltonian. It's diagonal in this basis. And so that comes out of this expression. And we are left now to calculating the expectation value of hx, uh, e to the minus delta tau hx between the states sigma z at time step L and sigma z at time step L plus one. Okay, so we can now, there's some algebra here. And um, what that involves is expanding this operator as a power series. And you can see that all the even terms will involve sigma x square, which is an identity uh, for each of the Pauli matrices. But here for sigma x that we have to look at here, it's an identity. And uh, all the odd terms will have one of these sigma x operators that is left over. So we will get um, a cosh delta times the delta tau, the time step, plus a sine hyperbolic of delta times delta tau times the Pauli matrix, the operator. And we now want to take the expectation value of these terms between sigma lz and sigma l plus one z. So let's write out all the possible configurations on these, of these two um, time steps. The two spins could be both up or both down or one up and one down. So we have these four possibilities. And if you look at the sigma x expectation value, since it flips a spin, you can see when the two spins are the same, uh, you get an expectation value, which is zero. But when they are different, you get a unity from this uh, expectation value, or rather from this matrix element. Um, on the other hand, for the Cauch term, uh, you have sigma LZ, sigma L plus one Z overlap, and that is one only when the two spins are the same. So you can easily show then that this expression can be written uh, in this way, uh, as I've summarized here. Um, so when the two spins are the same, then you will get e to the delta tau times delta from here, and this will give you one, and you'll get e to the minus delta tau times delta. And when you add them up, you will get cosh delta tau delta, which is what you have here for when the two spins are the same. On the other hand, when the two spins are different, then um, Sigma LZ, Sigma L plus one Z will give you a minus one. And the two terms will then add up and give you a sine hyperbolic term. So that's just simple algebra, but what you can see from there is, is that this uh, partition function over a time step delta tau can be written as some factor gamma e to the power small gamma here sigma LZ, sigma L plus one C. So now we have the final uh, quantum partition function. We can collect all the terms and you can see that it has the following form. It's a sum over all the configurations on each of the time steps. You know, so all of the M types time steps are involved and it's, uh, essentially each time step, we have to do this, uh, this um, evaluation 
e to the delta tau h sigma lz times e to the gamma sigma lz sigma l plus 1z. And gamma depends on is this term here. It's a log of the tanch of, of uh, delta times delta tau. So what is important here is to notice the structure of this term. Um, the first one acts on a particular time step, sigma L Z, and involves the, uh, the magnetic field, which was coupling to just the spin in the Z direction. The X spin that we had in the Hamiltonian has now been replaced by a product of sigma z spins that act on successive time slices. Okay, so noticing this form and comparing it now to the one dimensional uh, transverse field Ising model, we can see right away that the correspondence is the following. The, just to remind you, the transverse field Ising model had these two terms there was a exchange term that coupled uh, spins on nearest neighbor sites. Those were spatial sites. Now you can think of these as exactly the two sites in the time direction that are replacing the role of the two sites in the spatial direction. And H was the uh, term that, sorry, this was a sigma LX here. Okay, so the correspondence is that in the classical problem, we had a beta H and that is being replaced by delta tau H. And we similarly had a beta J, which is being replaced by this gam little gamma, which involves delta, the um, magnetic field in the X direction. And uh, the number of sites in the lattice in the classical problem is being replaced by the number of time slices. So that's in essence the idea of the classical to quantum mapping, what you get are um, beta essentially becomes, a, essentially beta becomes a new dimension. So that's how uh, the quantum problem is expanded into a classical problem in one higher dimension. Also the two non-commuting terms in the quantum problem, the magnetic field that coupled to the Z spin uh, and the magnetic field that couple to the X spin, they map on to either um, on-site terms or inter-site terms. And in that way, you can see that the role of the non-commuting term becomes the one that connects two different time slices. Okay, so this is extremely fundamental and plays out in many different problems. And we will see, um, see it in action in another problem very soon in the next lecture on a superconductor to insulator transition. But um, otherwise, uh, please go over this mapping and try to understand uh, the language and try to see the um, connection between what we have done previously, the transverse field Ising model and uh, this classical problem that we have now mapped it to. Okay, thank you and see you uh, next time.